I'm very proud to be a kinswoman of Herman. Very proud indeed. I weep for the calamities that beset him during a short life, but I do find him again in laughter in his writings. I think he must have been a terribly complex person. I don't think anybody, no matter how they research him, will ever get inside his head and quite know Hermann Charles Bosman. Sunday, 19th of July. 1926. The shot that split the silence in the early hours of that morning, killing a young motor mechanic, was fired by his stepbrother, Herman Charles Bosman. It appears that during a fight in a darkened room, Bosman discharged the bullet that ended David Russell's life and twisted the entire direction of his own. This event and those that followed became the basis of Bosman's book, Cold Stone Jug, later adapted for the stage by Patrick Mainhardt bringing Bosman down from the bookshelves and into the lives of many who might not otherwise have discovered him. There were about a dozen prisoners in the cells of Marshall Square. It was getting on towards late afternoon on a Sunday that we'd spent locked up in a cell that was three quarters underground and that had barred apertures opening onto the pavement on the corner of McLaren and Marshall Streets, Johannesburg. I had been arrested about... 15 or 16 hours before. Those first few hours in the cells, serving as the overture to a long period of imprisonment, were the most miserable I've ever known. Then, when it was getting on towards late afternoon, one of the prisoners, a dapper little fellow who had done most of the talking and who seemed to exercise some sort of leadership inside the cell, felt it was time we got sort of cosy together and started taking more of a personal interest in one another's affairs. I'm in for liquor selling myself, he announced to a man standing next to him. What are you pinched for, huh? Stealing a wheelbarrow from the PWD, came the answer. And not that I done it, mind you, but that's the charge. Mm -hmm. And what are you in for? The cell boss demanded of the next man drunken and disorderly and indecent exposure came the answer. Mm -hmm. And your charge? Me? <laughs> Forgery. And if I drop this time, I'll get seven years. And so this dapper little fellow who was doing all the questioning worked his way right through the whole lot until it came to my turn. Say, what are you pinched for, hmm? He asked, eyeing me narrowly. Murder, I answered. And in my tone, there was no discourtesy, and I did not glower much. I only added, I'm not feeling too good. Christmas was coming. There was a Charleston contest at St. James, a Mary Pickford film at the Bijou, and a Rudolph Valentino at the Standard. And across town, the final scenes of another drama were being played out in the Rand Criminal Court. You are hereby court. sentenced to death by hanging. And you are to be taken to a place of custody where you will be kept until you are hanged by the neck, until you are dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. Gentle. Gentle. I could never associate, it. associate him with taking a man's life. I could never. Capable of unbelievable cruelty and then again would show a kindness that one could credit, one could hardly credit to him. He was a person who, who could make one feel all kinds of things. He could make one laugh more than anything else in the world. To me, Herman Bosman was a complicated mixture of an anarchist and a humanist. You know, Bosman once read that humor came from the heart and wit from the intellect, and he had no respect for the intellect whatsoever. But he said that uh, when he thought something was funny, 
if he had to stop and analyze whether it was from the heart or the intellect, he wouldn't want to laugh anyway. There was one warder whom Stoffels, who shared the death cell with me, and I nicknamed the Clown. He hadn't been in the prison service very long, and we joshed him unmercifully. He afforded us many nights of first-class entertainment when we couldn't get to sleep, and were afraid to trust our heads to the hard pallet in case when we woke up in the morning, it would be to find the sheriff standing at the door with a death warrant. The clown had a very simple heart. One night, through a process of not very subtle flattery, we got him to acknowledge that he could dance rather well. We also got him to admit that, in general, males were envious of his ballroom accomplishments and that behind his back they said many nasty things about him. Yeah, such as that he danced like a sick hippopotamus or the way a duck waddles. All because they were jealous of him. We even got him to show us a few of the latest dance steps. For this purpose, he removed his heavy warder's boots. At the clown's demonstration in stockinged feet, of the then fashionable black bottom, a black bottom. He was, uh, he saw you man everything, and he saw sadness in everything. He, uh, I think, but I think the thread of humor goes through everything. Bosman was essentially a serious thinker and an intellect and also a tragic figure. We all suddenly stopped laughing, for a key grated in the outer door, and the night headwater entered. What's all this? The convicts at the other end of the hall are complaining they can't get to sleep. The way you two men in the condemned cells keep on laughing all night long, and this isn't the first night neither. You condemned men mustn't laugh so loud. The hard labor convicts have got to sleep. They've got to work hard all day. You two don't do nothing but smoke cigarettes and crack jokes all the time. You'll get yourselves in serious trouble. Yeah, very serious trouble indeed, if the governor finds out that you keep the whole prison awake night after night with your romping about and laughing in the condemned cell. I wondered vaguely what more serious trouble we could get into than we were already in. It's difficult for me to talk about Herman uh, with the usual eulogistic whitewashing thing that goes on about him. He was no completely white or completely black character. He was no hero totally, nor was he a total villain. He had done everything. Everything bad a man can do from murder to abortion to all the holiest things a man can do. All of these were were part of Herman. As my companion in the death cell for more than four weeks, Stoffels had done a good deal to cheer me up. And yet on the morning of his execution, there was nothing I could think of saying to him. I, I could think of no last quip to make, no final word of comfort. In the shadow of the gallows, I had found that a jest or a solemn speech mean just about the same thing, but even if I could have thought up something to say, I would have had no opportunity of saying it. For early that morning, two warders fetched me out of my cell and locked me into a cell two doors away. They didn't lock the door, though, but only the grill gate. And from the sound I heard afterwards, when the hangman came to perform his office, it sounded as though everything went off very efficiently. There was a tramping of feet on iron stairs, and the sound of doors being locked and unlocked. No sound of voices. No orders had to be given. Each man knew what was expected of him. Even Stoffels, who played his part tolerably well, considering the fact that he was not rehearsed in it and was getting no pay for it. The rest of the actors in this early morning drama of the gallows, the governor, the warders, the hangman, the chaplain, the doctor were all salaried officials of the administration. Only Stoffels was giving his services free. I heard what sounded like a quick scuffle, then many footfalls, then a muffled noise in which I recognized Stoffels' voice. But with difficulty, for only part of that noise seemed to come out of his throat. The rest of it seemed to have come out of his belly. More heavy footfalls, doors creaking in hinges, and still no rapt out words of command. And then a mighty slam! the whole building, 
rattling the pannikin on the floor of the cell in which I was. It was all over. The first grandchild recorded in the Milan family Bible was Herman Charles Bosman. His mother, Lisa, like all her brothers and sisters, was born in the Cape. And from her came the quicksilver spirit that revealed itself in the magic of the things that Bosman wrote and lived. Sometimes that same spirit created havoc that engulfed him and those close to him. He was educated at Krugersdorp Preparatory School, Potchefstroom College, Jeffy Central, Jeffy High and Houghton College, from where he failed to matriculate. His maths was abysmal. Eligible only for a teaching diploma, he attended normal college and the University of the Witwatersrand, raising hell in both. At the age of 20, he acquired his diploma and a wife, in that order. The weekend before he was to leave for his first teaching post, he borrowed five pounds from Vera Sawyer and married her under the name Herbert Charles Boswell. When we left the normal college, I was sent to a farm school in the eastern Transvaal and he to Groot Mariko. The school at Heinweerberg, to which Bosman was sent, was typical of the small farm schools of the time, generally run by one or two teachers. He boarded with a local family of which the mother was a district nurse. He also acquired a rifle, which he took back to Johannesburg when he went on leave. This was the gun that killed his stepbrother. A number of us who espoused his cause and would never believe that he had really committed murder, went to visit him at Pretoria Central Jail after the death sentence had been imposed. We told him that we were getting up a petition, and he then said to us, if it's successful, Please approach the Transvaal Education Department and see if I can get a job at Jeppy High as a shooting instructor. And one morning, I awoke to find the governor and the chief warder and the section officer and the warder on duty in the death cell standing in a ring around me. I woke up and rubbed my eyes. The governor was talking. And in the sudden import of his words and his visit dawned on me. It was the governor who had called on me, and not the sheriff. Not the sheriff. And then I got the gist of it. The governor was saying that my sentence had been commuted to a term of imprisonment with hard labor for so many years. I got out of that condemned cell in such a hurry that I did not hear all the years. Bosman didn't serve the ten years hard labor. For early in his fourth year, he petitioned for remission. And in 1930, he was granted a parole. Those last eight months passed quickly. On the day that I was due for discharge, I went to speak to my section warder. Excuse me, sir. I'm due our today, sir. I suppose I remain here in the section until they send for the discharges, sir. But the section warder said no. He hadn't been notified. Anyway, I showed him my ticket, and we got a pencil and a piece of paper, and we worked it out together. There was no doubt about it. I was due for discharge, and right away. Yeah, but I got no instructions. Fall in for work. Then in the workshop, I showed my ticket to the head warder, and he also worked out the figures and stretched his head and looked puzzled. Yeah, but I can't do nothing about it. That's for the discipline stop. I'm only the head trades warder here, so get on with your blooming job. Yes, sir. Then I showed my ticket to several other convicts, and they too could see at once that I was due for immediate discharge. They, uh, they must have lost your papers at head office. One long time has suggested. That means you'll never get out now. You don't exist for them no more. I remember the case of... But I moved away quickly. I wanted to hear no bad luck stories. I was terrified of ill omen precedents. Next day in the office, I went to see the chief warder about my getting released, and he also agreed with me that according to the law, I was a free man. It said so on my ticket. Yes, sir. I am free. I am a free man, sir. There's nothing to keep me here anymore. Nothing except the bars and the locks and the warders. But see, sir, I am here, sir, am I not? 
And according to the details of my sentence and my remission, I, I have no right to be here, sir. In theory, I'm not a hard labor convict at all. What do you want, then, eh? Perhaps you'd like a job here as chief warder. Now, don't be afraid to say so. But I assure the chief warder, trying hard to keep saying that I wanted no job in the prison, that I wanted no part of the prison, that all I wanted was to get as far away from the prison as quickly as possible. Oh. Yeah, well, look a minute. Uh, it must be your file that it offers. Well, Verachtag, something must have happened with your file. Look, I'll, uh, I'll tell you what. Next time I get an hour or two, I'll uh, slip away and uh, see what I can do about it. On the 15th of August, 1930, he finally left the prison. A changed man entering a changed world, undecided, and unsure about his future. His cousin Zita Kofia recalls. His mother, who is my father's sister, was afraid that her husband, who was the father of the son Herman had shot, would take revenge because he had spoken about doing that. And also, she thought he would need time to adapt himself to the normality of life. So she asked my father whether he could stay with us on our farm at Kreefontein at Bronco Strait. Well, my father wasn't very really sympathetic towards him at that stage for the hurt he had done to his mother, but he agreed. And uh, I can remember my mother saying, objecting and saying, well, <laughs> what are we going to do with him? I, I mean, he, we wake up in the morning to find our throats cut or something. After all, he is a murderer, and what will the neighbours think? So we decided not to say a word about his being an ex-convict. He was just a relation who'd come to stay. Remember, when he arrived, my father went to fetch him at the uh, station, and he had a battered typewriter and suitcase and some books, I suppose. He so worldly belongings at that stage. Of course, I was terribly excited, being an only child and a lonely four farm of thousands of Morgan, looking forward to this companionship and this aura of mystery that surrounded this man. When Bosman returned to Johannesburg, he teamed up with an old friend, Egidius Jean Brino, and together they went into the publishing business. Johannesburg had grown four years older, the Charleston and the Black Bottom were no longer the rage at parties, and the whole of Joubert Street had broken out with ballroom dancing studios. Music instruction was provided by people like Teddy Garrett, piano syncopation, violin and saxophone, George Moss, and banjo and guitar, Bert King. And all of them advertised in one of Johannesburg's early literary magazines, The Toe Layer. <laughs> I remember well when we got the first issue of the tow layer in 1930, I think it was December or January 1931. We walked along the street towards the offices from the technical press, and Herman suddenly stopped, placed it on the pavement, stood back a yard or two to improve the perspective, and said, Yes, Gene, it's good outside too. That was an illusion to our stories inside the pages, where his Makapan's caves lay like a gem. Makapan's caves, the gramophone, the Roynek, and some strangely erotic poetry, all signed with Bosman's post-prison pen name, Herman Malone. While we were on the tailor, tail both Bosman and I never got paid. Consequently, we were soon on pretty short commons. Not only weren't we paid, but we often we had to rally around with such monies as we could scrape together to bed it out. Then came the scandal sheets where Herman and Jean crusaded against the corruption of the big sheep press, the legal and penal systems, and the establishment in general. Everybody retaliated. 
Jean enjoyed nothing more than a legal skirmish, and particularly when he conducted the defense himself. Between the time a misdemeanor was filed and the time it came to court, several others had been committed, rather like a hectic form of leapfrog. Bosman chose this time to fall deeply in love, twice. His first love inspired his first volume of poetry, The Blue Princess, and the second became his second wife, Ella. He went into the Johannesburg Public Library's research department one day and asked for a book of the poems of Baudelaire. And the librarian, a beautiful young lady, said to him, do you like Baudelaire? And as he said, he admitted very shyly that yes, he did. And she said, so do I. And he said, let's go to Brussels. Now, this is how he told it to me. He's told the story in many differing versions to many other people. And he said they walked out of the library and went to Brussels, and they knew they were in Brussels when they saw the Brussels sprouts and the vendors' carts through the train window. And they went to the house that had been occupied by Baudelaire during his lifetime, and they found it was unoccupied and moved into it and lived there for a while. Now, these events were described to me as having taken place instantaneously. Was, perhaps a week had passed before they got to Brussels. But in point of actual time, it took about six years. But to a poet like Herman, six years was of very little consequence. Ella played a remarkable and a great part in his life. Herman had a, a strange, romantic attitude to women. He really belonged with people like Keats and Shelley and, I would say, Edgar Allan Poe in his approach to women. He was unsure of himself as a lover. He had to prove himself many a time. He had a strange hang-up about himself, sexually, but funnily enough, women loved him. Uh, and two of them, I know, uh, Helena and Vera, had at times been treated most abominably by him. Helena during the Petersburg period, and Vera, <laughs> who had always stood by him but who is a strange, indecipherable figure in his life. As I've said, Bosman belonged with the great romantics. He considered himself more than anything else to be a poet. He used to call himself a poet. He called it poetry. He taught once at Damelin College English literature, and they called him old poetry, and he was a bit shy of his profession. No, it couldn't be his profession, because he never made any money out of it. But it was what he called his vocation, shall we put it that way. He wrote some of the most resoundingly beautiful romantic poetry ever to have appeared in this country. I think of lines like, my westering heart is sunset stained but white with the languorous lips had been of Ella Lean. Herman and Ella spent five and a half years in London, barren years creatively and materially. They were permanently broke and even staged a fictitious death which brought them in a little extra money sent by his family for funeral expenses. He had to polish steps in London to make a living he was always very proud of the fact that his steps were the cleanest and the brightest, the best polished in the street. He couldn't make a living any other way. He berated Ella once, said to her, look what you've done to me. You've reduced me to a man in the gutter. And she said to him, what better place for a poet to be in than the gutter? On September the 3rd, 1939, Britain declared war on Nazi Germany. 
the Bosmans were eligible for repatriation to South Africa and left suddenly in the customary poetic style without payment of the rent. The first steady job Bosman found was in 1943 as editor of Petersburg's English newspaper, the Salzburg Review. Its readers were in for a shock. If they were absorbed in the war effort, he was concerned with art. Val Rosenberg prompts the memory of Pierre de Vette. something about you that happened in about 1943. Oh, up in Petersburg. Yes, he went to you backstage. Well, that's right, he came backstage ah. after the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite a surprise to me because not many people come backstage on the plot alone, except the Dumini. He, he walked into the dressing room. Uh -huh. This tall man with a hat, very rakish angle, mm -hmm. over the one eye. Mm. And he didn't take his hat off. Introduced himself and so forth. And uh, we chatted, and I could see that he was interested in this character that I did because it was a very, very simple character, and all his characters are simple. Yeah. And uh, what intrigued him most, I think, was the crying in the public, in, in, in the audience. Mm. Uh, he felt that women cried easily, but to see men weeping copiously, mm. this was interesting. And I said, yes, yes, it does seem to affect them. And then he explained that he also would have liked to have cried. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I sat there and everybody around me was weeping and I was hoping that I could, as it were, build a telephone booth around myself mm. and weep naturally or <laughs> copiously again, unashamedly. Bosman had a bad time in Petersburg. His creative ability seemed to have left him. Indeed, he had stopped writing poetry completely. Then he met a schoolteacher. Helena Stegman, and his life was transformed. One thinks of the poem Seed. The farmer plows into the ground more than the wheat seed thrown on the ground. The farmer plows into the ground, the plow and the oxen, and his body. He plows into the ground the farmstead and the cattle, and the pigs and the poultry and the kitchen utensils and the afternoon sunlight streaming in through the window of the Fures, and the light entangled in the eyes of his children. He plows into the ground his wife's brown body, and the windmill above the borehole, and the borehole and the wind driving the windmill. The farmer plows the blue clouds into the ground and as a tribute to the holocaust of the plowshare to the sowing that was the parting of the juggernaut the earth renders the farmer in due season corn now that poem could only have been written in this country by an Afrikaner it is so deeply rooted. And it is, although it's in English, it is an Afrikaans poem. And that's the wonder of a tremendous amount of Bosman, a tremendous amount of his work, is that he wrote in Afrikaans in the English language. A fantastic achievement. You are never conscious of London and the British tradition behind the language when you read Bosman. The war ended, and the soldiers came home. Among them was Gordon Forster. Well, I'd come back here to, to South Africa in 1946. I stayed on in Europe a while. And it was actually in Europe that I read Herman Bosman's stories. Uh, magazines like the South African Opinion used to arrive up there. I became a very big fan of the man. And when I got back here, the first thing I did was to try to, to get to know him. I had an enormous respect for him. I felt he was a worthy man to seek out and to let me put it frankly, become a disciple of. I decided to take his books 
to hospital with me. In fact, I had to take them. There were only, only books that I took with. And he helped me through, together with Gordon, he helped me through a really tough time. Well, it was during the late 40s that Herman's first hardcover books started coming out. I remember the first novel, Jacaranda in the Night. He referred to it himself as a strange, rough, raw, coarse book, like the landscape it described. It centered around Petersburg, and he was to return to the Petersburg theme many a time after that to attempt to capture the story of dwarf life. I don't think he was very happy with Jacaranda as a novel, but as an event in his life, he was delirious with happiness. In the meantime, Herman had written the stories that make up the volume called Mafeking Road. This was a major literary event in South Africa. It was the finest collection of short stories that had ever been published in this country. I say that very definitely. I ask you to forgive my prejudice here. I am enormously prejudiced. But it was a fine thing to happen to South African letters. Mariko, forgotten by time. This was a land settled by people within one generation of two Anglo-Boer wars and three republics, and within living memory of the massacre of a party of Boers by Chief Makapan and his warriors. They were people who came to seek a new country. Transport riders remained to become farmers. Hunters stayed to become conservationists. And so this world Bosman discovered, teemed with images and folk still to be found today in the descendants of those war veterans, Predacons, constables, and felt maidens, the faithful and the faithless who walked his mafficking road. I know what it is, as Clark Lawrence said, when you talk that way about the felt. I've known people who sit like you do and dream about the felt and talk strange things and start believing in what they call the soul of the felt. Until in the end, the felt means a different thing to them from what it does to me. I only know that the felt can be used for growing mealies on, but it isn't very good for that either. Also, it means very hard work for me growing mealies the plowing, for instance. I used to get aches in my back and shoulders from sitting on a stone all day long on the edge of the lands, watching the kaffirs and the oxen and the plow going up and down, making furrows. The only real cure for this plowing sickness is to sit quietly on a rimpish bench on the stoop with one's legs raised, slightly drinking coffee until the plowing season is over. Most of the farmers of the Mariko Bushveld have adopted this remedy. It was in the early summer, shortly after the rains, that I first came across John the Swart. He was a young fellow with long black hair. When I got nearer, I saw what he was doing. He had a piece of white buck sail on the stand in front of him, and he was painting my farm. He seemed to have picked out all the useless bits for his pictures, a grants and a few stones and some clumps of khaki boss. Young man, I said, after we'd introduced ourselves, when people in Johannesburg see that picture, they will laugh and say that Scott Lawrence lives on a barren piece of rock like a lizard does. Why don't you rather paint the fertile parts? Look at that clay there. And the dam. Put in that new cattle dip that I've just built up with a reinforced concrete. Then if Pit Grobler or General Kemp sees this picture, he'll know at once that Scott Lawrence has been making improvements on his farm. The young painter shook his head. No, he said, I want to paint only the felt. I hate the idea of painting boreholes and cattle dips and houses and concrete, especially concrete. 
John de Swatkin took me into his tent and he showed me some other pictures he had painted at different places along the Dwarsberger. They were all the same sort of pictures, barren and stony. And I thought it would be a good idea if the government put up a lot of pictures like that on the Kalahari border for the locusts to see. Because that would keep the locusts out of the Mariko. Then John de Swat showed me another picture he had painted. Now, you see, I'm supposed to stop talking there, but I can't, because if... Uh, you, you can never do that to Herman. Listen to what comes. It's, if the Predacant saw it, he'd call it by other names, I replied. Now, that's a nice place to stop, excepting it goes on to... But I'm a broad-minded man. I've been once in the bar in Zerest and twice in the bioscope, when I should have been attending Nachmar. So I don't hold it against the young man for having ideas like this. But you mustn't let anybody here see this felt maiden unless you paint a few more clothes on her. Roy Campbell called them the greatest short stories to come out of South Africa. Bosman spent his last years trying to match them with a novel on Dort life. He died trying. I don't know if it was deliberate that he bought in Lombardy East in Milton Road, but he called the house Paradise Regained. He even had Andre make up a little sign for him that said Paradise Regained. And there was a party. So everybody was there. Benny Sachs was there, and Lionel, and... Charles Eglinton and oh, all the boys, uh, Arthur Conn and uh, everybody. And that night he got poor old Benny Sachs in a corner and he said to him, I am now going to recite to you in the French Baudelaire's translation of Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death, which he did. It took him nearly half an hour. But funny, his choice. of that particular story of Poe's. It grew late, the party was over, the guests left. It started raining. Yvonne and I were among the last guests to leave and it was raining very hard. And as we pulled out of the gate, I saw that the little sign Paradise Regained had been littered in watercolors and that the rain was washing it off, obliterating the sign completely. And the next morning I heard that it had indeed been his farewell party and that he died. I don't believe in his death. Do writers live, or are they ghosts? The Herman, to me, was never a tangible person or a personality. His flesh was the frailest I had ever seen on the man. We as South Africans have learned to love him. He's part of our scene, and he's part of our culture, and those ephemeral things, culture and poetry, are perhaps spoken on the wind and blown away easily, and yet they are the most permanent things, you know. Much more permanent than any of your factories, any of the great buildings or any of the great cities. Because it is a permanence of the soul, of the spirit, and that is the only permanence that a nation really has. The best thing I can say about him is that he is as much of South Africa as the thorn trees and the wind.